This week on the Crisis Conflict Emergency Management Podcast. You know, horrible experience that people you meet in these crisis zones convey to you. You can always hold on to the hope that, well, maybe we can help them. Maybe they can um, find a way to get their lives back and and, uh, things can get better in the future. I think you have to have that mindset if you're going to spend the whole of your adult life doing this kind of work. Welcome to the Crisis, Conflict, and Emergency Management Podcast, where we have global conversations and share perspectives about international crisis, preparedness, and how to build more resilient societies. My name is Kyle, and I'll be your host. And just how vulnerable are we to the changing international environment, and what can we learn from this experience? From AI to space warfare to community development and crisis communications, there's something here for everyone. Join us for unique international conversations and perspectives into the current threats, challenges, and risks to our society. This podcast is brought to you by Capacity Building and International and sponsored by the International Emergency Management Society. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so this is Kyle, Managing Director of Capacity Bill International, and here today we are joined by Sir Mark Andrew Locock, who is a British economist and accountant who served as the United Nations Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, the head of the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs between 2017 and 2021. Prior to his appointment in May 2017, he was the Permanent Secretary of the Department for International Development, DFID, in the UK, and he is currently a visiting professor in practice at the Department of International Development at the London School of Economics and Distinguished Non-Resident Fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. He is also a trustee director of the Howard Partnership Trust, a multi-academy trust of schools, including for children with learning disabilities in Surrey. So, Mark, thank you for joining us today. Good to be with you. So you have quite the impressive background. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is that you have a new book coming out called Relief Chief. And you provide some very knowledgeable insights into the international community and the system and how it functions and the challenges in in essentially coordinating, negotiating, and delivering humanitarian assistance. And of course, as we all know, while everyone is focused on Ukraine, and we'll get to that topic shortly, As a starting point for our discussion, I think it would be very valuable for us to sort of have a short overview of sort of your experiences in that global crisis management perspective in terms of like countries and and areas that you've been in. Could you give us a brief background? Sure. So I started working on these issues in the mid-1980s. My first job actually was working on the famine in Ethiopia then, which took the lives of a million People. And I think I've probably dealt one way or another with all of the big humanitarian crises over the last subsequent 40 years or so. So the, you know, the conflicts, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Iraq, other parts of the Middle East, food crises around the world, but also storms and cyclones and floods and all of those other things. And my kind of my broad experience is that over the last 40 years, the average life experience for most people on the planet has improved a lot. When I was born 60 years ago, most people on the planet were hungry all the time. They watched their kids die in infancy. They didn't go to school. Life lasted much less long than it does now. And and what's changed is now not more than 50% of the global population whose lives are like that. It's less than 10%. But there's 30 or 40 countries on the planet which have left, been left behind, basically. And those countries have been dragged backwards by a few factors over the last seven or eight years. So if you just take the, the issue of food security, for example, um, 2015, there were about a bit less than 600 million people who weren't sure where their next meal would come from. Uh, now that's gone up to 830 million people. So We've seen such in the reversal of all this big progress. And that's happened basically for three reasons. Firstly, upsurging conflict around the world. And we'll talk about some of the places that's happened. Secondly, the growing and visible effects of climate change, more severe droughts, Somalia, other parts of the Horn of Africa right now, but also violent storms and changing rainfall patterns, which undermine traditional livelihoods. And then the third thing has been the pandemic. The pandemic's really dragged down those 30 or 40 poorest countries to a much greater degree than is generally appreciated and much in a much, much worse way than was, was the case for richer countries. So that's added to the, if you like, the scale of humanitarian need as well. So now we do face a really uh, an inflection point, I think, a point where 
after a long period where things are generally getting better, that stopped and they're going backwards and the causes aren't being addressed. And although the aid agencies do a very good job reaching maybe 100 million people every year, certainly saving millions of lives every year, they are increasingly overwhelmed. So the, the reason I wrote my book, Relief Chief, as, which you mentioned, is to describe this situation, but also to describe lots of things the aid agencies could be doing right now better to deal with this problem. Well, thanks for that. And and let's talk about that for just a second, because in the book you wrote that uh, in late 2020, your office analyzed the humanitarian problems the UN had been dealing with over the previous 25 years. The findings you found were quite sobering, which is between 1995 and 2020, the average duration of crises requiring a UN coordinated response increased from less than two years to nearly seven years. And the number of responses also more than doubled, with more countries like Syria, Libya, and several in the Sahel and Venezuela being added to the list of those where humanitarian assistance was needed. And the size of response plans grew even more dramatically, just from over two billion in 1995 to nearly 40 billion in 2020. And I think that's quite interesting because I think I just saw an article just the other day where in the United States we started to build this idea, or at least discuss this concept of the fact that now everything's going to be a billion dollar disaster and just because of the nature of these sort of three events that you're talking about is that we're simply going to have these catastrophic events more often and just going to be even more and more complex to deal with so from that perspective in 2020 to even now in 2022 what are you seeing in terms of the the conditions that we're facing and maybe elaborate on three points that you already mentioned well the things that we found in 2020 has simply got worse over the last two years. And that is exemplified by what happened in Afghanistan with the, uh, you know, the Taliban taking over again and uh, huge humanitarian problems arising as a result, especially millions of Afghans basically really struggling now to get enough food to eat. And then it's really been exacerbated very dramatically by what Putin has done in Ukraine. Um, Obviously, there's the horror of the impact of the war and the fighting and the flouting, whole scale, industrial scale flouting by Putin of the accepted laws of war, which Russia indeed has been party to for a long time. But in fact, the ripple effect of this crisis is global. We all see it in rich countries because when we go to the grocery store, the the bill we pay at the end of the visit is much higher than it used to be. When we look at our energy bills, they're much higher. Most of us in rich countries will cope with that one way or another. But in very poor countries, this huge hike in food prices has taken people from the point where they were hungry to the point now where they are starving and may not survive. Um, so, you know, and all of that comes on top of what was already a growing trend of more long-lasting, more brutal, more dangerous conflicts, together with growing impacts of climate change and, and as I said earlier, the pandemic. Fundamentally, what the world needs to do is to address the causes of these problems. And of course, that's difficult because to address the causes of conflict requires the powerful countries in the world to interact with each other in a constructive way, which is not what we're seeing at the moment. But if we want that trend to be reversed, that's the only way forward. On climate change, likewise, you know, the world has made baby steps towards trying to slow the rate of growth of um, emissions, but there needs to be a lot more done. And crucially, there needs to be a lot bigger focus on helping these very vulnerable countries adapt to the reality of the fact that their climates have changed. Many of those countries will not be able to um, rub along in future on the basis of traditional livelihoods. I used to travel a lot to Southern Africa. I used to live in Southern Africa, in fact. And I remember on recent visits uh, going to talk to farmers on Lake Malawi, the shores of Lake Malawi, who were saying to me, you know, 30 years ago, um, every season there would be enough rain to grow the maize and to ripen it and for us to harvest it. And it was predictable enough. And now, many, many years, that doesn't happen. You might get one decent year in four. And so those traditional livelihoods are no longer viable. So countries need to diversify their economies and create opportunities for people to make make livelihoods in different ways. Now, some of that stuff isn't about the work of the humanitarian agencies. What the humanitarian agencies do is deal with the acute problem when it becomes so extreme that many people are at risk of 
losing their lives. And they do a very good job, to be clear. Um, you know, the quality of humanitarian assistance, what's provided and, you know, the skills and professionalism of the people doing it is much higher than it was when I started my career. Just to give you one example of that, in, in mid-1980s, that job I was doing on famine relief in Ethiopia, then we thought that the thing to do was simply to provide people with food and water. Now we know that when people die in famine, it's mostly because of an infection or some other disease which a healthy person can fight off and a starving one can't. And so what you have to do as part of your famine relief efforts is immunise kids and provide basic health services. So the quality of response has increased. That's that's actually one of the reasons why the bill has got higher. But the underlying growth in the number of problems, that's really what's driving these big um, increases in need and bringing back onto the onto the scene things that we we nearly eliminated from the human condition we nearly got rid of famines from the human condition for example famine used to be very common all around the world for most of human history the worst famines the world has ever seen in fact in the 20th century um, but they've almost disappeared there's only been one famine so far in the 21st century which was the one that took a quarter million lives in somalia in 2011 Otherwise, famines, when they've threatened, have been staved off and, and there's been enough action taken to prevent the worst. But, but, you know, because of this global food crisis now, there's a danger that we will revert to the situation, which was quite common in the 20th century and before, unless we take different actions. It's interesting that you say, of course, that the, the quality of the response has gotten better. And of course, that's leading to a higher price tag from the, the participating states and the nations and, and member nations to be able to contribute. How do you strike a balance? I mean, because you were sort of at the top of this humanitarian relief organization and you were working specifically in coordinating relief. And I imagine, you know, of course, you, you dealt with you know, nations and delegations and everything else. And how did you find a balance or strike a balance between the growing need, the diversification of need, and of course, the increasing cost from the international community and what was required? Well, my job and the job of my office, and this was a post that was created by the General Assembly of the United Nations. In other words, all the countries in the world coming together in their, their highest level forum created this post in 1991. And I was the I was the lucky 13th holder of this uh, post, 13, not particularly lucky number in the culture I come from. And in fact, I did the job for twice as long on, as the average of my 12 predecessors. And I did it during the time when these needs were growing very dramatically. And the job essentially was to identify the places these crises were happening now or going to emerge, to develop plans to respond to them, to help raise the money for all the agencies, the UN World Food Programme, UNICEF, the NGOs, also a bit to help the Red Cross, although they have a, an independence in their structure as well, uh, to raise money to respond, and then to try to make sure there was a coordinated response, and then to help a bit with the delivery. So, you know, at the in December every year, we analysed what we thought the problems would be in the next year. We published all of that in a big report, and then we look crisis by crisis at who might help on what. And so, you know, every year we'd have an event, a big conference of foreign ministers and similar people on Syria, and we do something on Yemen, and likewise for the other big crises. One of the challenges for humanitarian agencies is that people who give them money, mostly nation states, mostly Western ones, but some in other places as well, like the Gulf, they give money for specific crises. So one of your challenges is you may have plenty of money, as is the case at the moment, actually, for Ukraine, but you might not have any money for Somalia. So one of the things we always had to do is kind of strike a balance between what we were saying to countries, um, yes, please do help us on Ukraine, but whatever you do, don't forget Somalia. Otherwise, you're going to find there's a huge catastrophe there. And communicating all that in a balanced way was a, was a kind of big part of the job. In fairness, it must be said that the fundraising was very successful. I mean, while I was doing the job, we we increased the funding we raised by 65% over those four years. Of course, that that comes out of a, a you know a problem that we needed that extra money. But we did raise additional money. And people sometimes worry about compassion fatigue or disappearing empathy. That wasn't my experience at all. My experience was when you communicate clearly about the scale of the problem, there's a lot of human empathy. 
both at the individual level and local groups in better off countries going together and wanting to do something, but also at the governmental level. But helping everybody see all the problems rather than focusing on the one that happens to be in the headlines of the newspaper or the broadcast of that day was a big part of the job. And so when you when you had these this forecast of like 12 months, and so a lot of people that listen to this podcast are either academics or practitioners in emergency and disaster management or crisis management. And, and you, sort of, you sort of have an idea of what your community is facing in terms of threats and risks and hazards, right? I mean, if you're in an earthquake zone, you know it's an earthquake zone, and that's not going to really change. <laughs> so how effective was, you know, a 12-month forecast, which was always probably changing, I imagine? Um, I mean, we talked about, of course, that the cycle has changed from two years to seven years on different relief operations, but how effective was a 12-month forecast? And then I guess is my, my first question, because, you know, we're all sort of traditionally used to we have a single set of scenarios or threats and risks and hazards that we look at and we exercise and we plan for those. And there's sort of a longer timeline to be prepared. But you're actually changing every year and your, your different perspectives. Uh, and then I guess the next question I would have is. What I think about when you when I hear you talk about sort of managing the expectations of nations and their contributions to the to the international sort of organization and system. And we, we recognize the growing complexity of, you know, climate change and, and food insecurity and all these issues and the growing cost. You know, at some point, these things are all going to come to a head and we have sort of this changing of nations to where it affects ultimately their GDP, which therefore they can't contribute, which means therefore we can't react. And then you have just sort of this slow rolling uh, global sort of crisis that's developing. So I'd like to sort of hear your thoughts about that as well. So on the first point, when we were doing these forward look reports and look back at a year later, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? What we found was we got 80 or 90% of it right. And that's not very surprising, really, because a lot of the crises were long lasting and there wasn't much going on to solve them. So it's not that difficult to guess, well, we'll have this problem for the next year. Every year, there were some things that we simply didn't predict. So well, back at the beginning of 2020, no one predicted the pandemic. Uh, beginning of 2021, no one predicted the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban. And the beginning of 2022, no one outside the Kremlin predicted what was going to about to happen in, in Ukraine. So there's always things you, that you, you don't know. And in fact, you can't know. A bigger bigger issue, though, is the things that you don't know, but you should know. And a lot of humanitarian disasters are predictable in the sense that you get good warning of something bad about to happen. So storms in the Caribbean, we get a week's notice to quite granular level of the path of the storm. And actually, that data on, on that kind of thing is used very well. It's one of the reasons why there's been a big reduction in loss of life through big storms in most countries around the world. And I talk about that a lot in the book and more things we need to do about that. Likewise, with droughts, when there's a drought for two years in Somalia, it's a slam dunk. There's going to be a big food security problem. And one of the things the aid agency system needs to be much better at is acting earlier when we know something bad is about to happen. And, and you know, concepts like insurance and contingency financing and pre-prepared plans and using data to predict things. I've got a lot in the book about how the modest experiments in using those kind of techniques have been proven to work and how really they should be scaled up in a dramatic um, way. Now, on your second question there, there is a paradox because actually, um, even though in the countries most vulnerable to these humanitarian crises over the last seven years or so, things have been getting significantly worse. Up till the pandemic, in most other places, they were still getting better. So there's a um, fragmentation going on between those countries which have escaped the poverty trap and were clawing their way forward still, and those countries which have never escaped. And the world really needs to have a much greater focus on those countries, many of them in Africa, actually. One or two other examples, Afghanistan, Haiti, um, Yemen, in other places as well. But a lot of this, this, you know, never escaped problem is an African problem. So the world needs to get better at dealing with that. 
Now, the pandemic has changed that somewhat because lots of countries have been dragged back. And there's a larger group of countries now which are facing increased um, indebtedness problems and are going to struggle to resume the growth rates that they had previously. But I, I still think that it is a big problem that the international development system does not focus enough on those 30 or 40 countries that never escaped the poverty trap and are being dragged down further and further as, as the years pass, particularly because of conflict and climate change. And until we get better at helping those countries claw their way a bit bit up the out of the morass, if you like, we shouldn't expect anything but problems getting much worse in those um, places. And, you know, it's going to be increasingly hard to sustain the track record we've we've had over recent decades of preventing these humanitarian problems in those sorts of countries, leading to mass loss of life running into millions of people. That has been largely prevented um, over the last 20 years or so. As I say, only one famine so far in this century. But that basically quite successful track record is really now a very clear and present danger of not being sustained. Hmm. And so when we when we look forward to the future, and you mentioned actually, you know, what we would typically call sort of mitigation or, and prevention measures, how can the international organizations be better in terms of that? I mean, you mentioned some things in terms of insurance and others, but with this 12-month cycle, which is a relatively short planning cycle, right? But um, with that sort of 12-month forecast, and then, you know, it, what would it take for the international organization to be able to take a more preemptive posture? Well, the... It's mostly about applying knowledge that we now have. Um, so the main requirements to be able to do this much better are firstly a slightly different posture from the financiers of these big organisations. So the World Bank could be doing a lot more of this anticipatory financing, for example, insurance and contingency financing. In order for that to happen, its shareholders need to give it the instructions to do that. Um, likewise, the sort of operational humanitarian agencies, the World Food Programme and so on, if their financiers would mandate them and, and require them to do more of that kind of work, they could do it. The agencies themselves also, though, need to think through their processes. There's something in the culture of these response agencies driven by, you know, adrenaline and, and um, emergency response mindsets, which rather likes the crisis mentality. And one of the things we should be trying to do is make these disasters dull, make them much less exciting and adrenaline driven because we react earlier in a calm and measured way because we can see what's about to happen. And so some of those concepts of having financing systems for these agencies, which allow them to deal with problems earlier and make them less reliant on the picture of the starving child appearing on the TV screen or in the newspaper being the driver of response, get the response, you know, automatically triggered much earlier. That, that, those are the, so in the, the financing countries and bodies and in the agencies, those are the um, mindset changes needed, really. And it's just interesting for me because the, the more people that I talk to about you know, these different topics internationally in terms of international response or crisis management or whatever the case is, it's, it, th there's a common language coming out of these conversations. And so whether you're dealing with issues at say a city level or municipality level or state or even international organizations with, with partner nations, it's the same sort of conversation, which is, are you going, you know, we can predict these things. We see these things are happening. That's obviously a threat and a risk and a hazard to the society. So will you invest in these things now? Can we, you know, mitigate this? Can we prevent it? Can we, you know, ensure these steps are in place so we can have an adequate response? And it's always sort of that same conversation, which I find very interesting, that everybody sort of has to advocate for a more, more proactive position. And, and you're not the first one to sort of talk about how it's a response-oriented mindset. You know, there's a lot of discussions around that you know, emergency response and sort of emergency management field around, you know, response orientation which is, I think we're evolving away from that, generally speaking, because a lot of people that filled those positions early on were response oriented, and now it's slowly changing. But it's interesting to, to think about the idea that in, from the international community perspective and from your persp perspective, I mean, what would happen if there's no disaster anymore, right? 
if there's no humanitarian crisis that you would be responding to, then what would that look like? And it's just a, a mental exercise, I think, that is quite interesting because we, you know, obviously it's... It's an ideal, but it's likely not going to happen. But it would be quite interesting. What would people be doing without international aid and disasters? Yeah, well, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when there was this, at that stage, there'd been these several decades of progress in, re- in, in improving lives for most people around the planet. Um, and there was a serious conversation inside some of these relief agencies about whether they'd be needed in future. So, you know, my former boss at the UN, Antonio Guterres, who at that time, 15 years ago, was was the head of the UN Refugee Agency, they had a real conversation as number of refugees around the world was falling in that basically around the turn of the century um, and the first few years of the current century. Well, maybe what are we going to do? Maybe we're not needed in future. And that's a success measure. That's what we should be aiming for. Uh, But, of course, the world has started to spin in a different way um, since then. And no one's talking about uh, we don't need UNHCR anymore. That's that's no longer the conversation. But we should aspire for that to be the conversation. Oh, definitely. And that's fascinating that that conversation was even taking place. One one of the things, if you spend your whole professional career doing dealing with these kinds of problems you need somewhere to look for solace and hope right (laughs) otherwise you're just confronting extreme human misery the whole time and unless you can see some potential for improvement it's probably not very healthy to be staying in this business um for the whole of your your working life sort of thing and because a lot of my experience in my career has been the flip side watching countries and trying to support countries progress and develop and get their kids into school and build their economies and develop their infrastructure. And that's been basically a huge global success story over the last 50 years. I've always held on to the view that um, however bad the situation is, I've seen enough places have improved and have moved forward. Um, And however much pain and suffering and, you know, horrible experience that people you meet in these crisis zones convey to you, you can always hold on to the hope that well, maybe we can help them. Maybe they can um, find a way to get their lives back, and and uh, things can get better into future in the future. I think you have to have that mindset if you're going to spend the whole of your adult life doing this kind of work. Oh, absolutely, and I, I think you have to hold on to that as well. And so, when we come back to the this this forecast, and and you're talking to nations. I mean, you're talking to nations in terms of you know we need to prepare, we need to possibly invest, and in, to mitigate any future issues. How was that conversation? Was that difficult to get the the funding in advance? I mean, you mentioned that you had 65% more funding than in previous years, but was it difficult then when you're forecasting and trying to get pro, more proactive use of funds? Yes, that's that's very difficult to go from getting a little bit of money to test out these concepts of acting before the disaster strikes, but when you know it's going to strike. You can get little bits of money. In my case, I was able to get tens of millions of dollars, you know, approaching maybe a hundred million dollars for the UN's addition and additional money for the UN Central Emergency Response Fund. But to get the bulk of the financing for this kind of emergency response, which in the period I was responsible for this at the UN, our financing overall grew from 12 billion to 20 billion. That's 65% that I talked about earlier. To get the bulk of that money much more focused on anticipatory action is very, very, has proved very difficult. And that requires different kinds of conversations. It it also requires, I think, probably enough calm and enough headspace and not not for all the relevant policymakers to be in the situation they're in now, which is just jumping firefighting from one problem to the next problem to the next problem. You know, you need enough headspace to redesign the system um, and in order to do that, you know, a, a slightly calmer period would help, I think. But it's not what we've got at the moment, obviously. So you mentioned redesigning the system. So what are your thoughts? I know you go into a bit more in the book, but what are some briefly some of your recommendations in redesigning the system? Well, you're right. There's a hundred different ideas in the book, but they're in a, a set of categories, basically. There's a set of ideas around acting earlier and preparing earlier and triggering responses when we know the problem will happen 
even if it hasn't crystallized. There's a set of things which are really important to do with how people behave in conflict and trying to get back into a on a trend that we were in until about 10 years ago of growing compliance with the laws of war. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, and it's really been exacerbated by what Putin's done in Ukraine, is growing violations. And the world's need to going to need to work out how to handle that. Um, and I've got some ideas in the book about some of the things we can do in that direction. Third thing is to do with trying to have a stronger focus on those groups who we know from decades of experience all over the world will always be the most vulnerable and focusing our help on those, especially women and girls and people with um, disabilities. We know they're always the, the people who will suffer most, but we don't design our programs with that as the fundamental starting point, and we should do that much more consistently. And then there's a set of ideas as well around how we can get a stronger focus on what the people caught up in these crises actually want when they're in need. So all the big decisions on what to do in your response tend to get taken between the agencies doing the work and the people giving them the money. So the people who we're all trying to help tend to be cut out of those big conversations. And that has two really serious consequences. The first is too often People get given stuff they don't want or need as the top priority. And then often they sell it in the local market to get cash to buy something they, they really do need. So that's all very inefficient. The second deleterious consequence, though, is that if one of the characteristics of people caught up in these crises, the victims of these crises, is um, they become very dependent. They, their agency is totally stripped away from them. They have very little control over their own lives. And that is an important dimension of their suffering. And so giving people the dignity, but also the agency to have a bit of control over their own lives is something we really ought to do. So one of my proposals is that we set up some kind of independent group, not the agencies doing the work, but some independent group, always to ask at the beginning of a crisis, to ask the people affected, so what help is it you want? And then to track as the response is being delivered, what help are they actually getting? And then to, to serve all that information back up to the donors and to the agencies, um, the idea being that once it becomes clearer that people aren't getting enough of the things they want, that will start to change if the information is served up in an independent Way. And I really do think that changing the, the sort of structures like that could have quite a big effect in the, uh, the overall um, impact of this work. So one of the things I was thinking about when you were explaining that is the idea, I, first of all, I completely agree on the local agency piece and, and of the host nation. And it's a lesson that has come through many of the international organizations that I've worked with, but I think it's really interesting and, and what i thought about when you were talking is from my experience the international organizations are a little bit too rigid in the way that they respond and so it's almost a template cookie cutter okay well this is this type of emergency so therefore we need set one two three type of response with this many people this is the cost etc and so as soon as you introduce local agency that may ask for something else, we don't necessarily know how to deal with that because it disrupts the system of a predetermined response. And that's why you always get, I don't know, a, a, a box of socks instead of <laughs> a box of shoes, you know, as right. a simple, stupid example. But it's just simply the idea of the fact that the system is designed to deliver a set component of a relief package. And yet when you try and say, okay, but we need to stop, think about it, and may possibly redesign it, that the system is not necessarily engineered to take that feedback and then to adjust accordingly. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? No, I completely agree with that. And my central point is, let's take as the starting point what the people who are trying to help say they want. Let's ask them what they want and then track whether we're giving it to them or not if we do those two ask those two simple questions what do you want what did you get we ask those two simple questions all the time what we'll find is we have a more responsive more efficient faster better more humane system 
Well, hopefully that's that's the case and that we can evolve and, and grow into that. I think, um, of course, we'd be remiss without talking a little bit about Ukraine and sort of what's going on, because you're right, it is challenging sort of the norms and the the ideas that I think it, that we had in terms of the international order of things. Um, and so when you're looking across that landscape of how things are developing in Ukraine, and especially with, with items like food security, what are, what are the thoughts? What do you see when you're watching these events wow. unfold? The the big thing is the impact of what's happened in Ukraine on global food security. Um, and that is the biggest loss of life in the Ukraine war, in fact, could be famines a long way away from Ukraine. Now, there's a bit more attention to that now in the last month or two than there was back in February, March, April time. Um, I think one issue that is going to start to become more prominent again over the next few months is a recognition that probably this conflict is going to go on for quite a long time and that Ukraine is going to need a lot of um, help going way beyond the military support it's getting from Western countries. It's going to need a lot more help than people maybe were anticipating in sustaining its own economy and keeping public services going and, um, you know, looking after the elderly and keeping kids in school and all that kind of thing. Now, there's a choice for the international community, Western countries in particular, about how that help is provided. It's, it, you know, the aid agencies will be able to do a lot and a lot of it will be good work. But there is a question about whether that's the best way to help Ukraine or whether it wouldn't, in fact, be much better to provide um, resources to the Ukrainians themselves through their budget, through economic support, fiscal support, and so on, so that their public services can be sustained and their state institutions can keep going. It's not a success measure to be in a position countries like um, Somalia are in at the moment where there's no state institutions that function to um, provide assistance to people where they would otherwise simply starve. It's international institutions that fill that gap. That is not, you know, that's not where you want to be. It is much better to try to sustain the country's own institutions to do that, that kind of support for people. Um, and there is going to be a, um, that I think is going to be one of the issues that becomes more prominent over the next few months as it becomes clear that the economic impact on Ukraine of this war is going to be long lasting and expensive. Um, so watch out for that one. I think that we also need to be watching quite hard for the danger of more atrocities of the sort we saw in Mariupol, Bucha, you know, violations of the laws of war, in other words. And the more that can be done to keep a bright, shining spotlight on the behaviour of um, the military um, actors, the better we will be able to deter some of those worst atrocities. It's also important to keep gathering evidence of these atrocities so that we hold out the hope that maybe at one point in the future there can be some accountability uh, for what's happened. People think now that that is hard to imagine, but I worked in the Bosnia Civil War in the 1990s, and in those days we were all tearing out our hair about whether there would ever be accountability for the people responsible for atrocities then. And lo and behold, years, sometimes decades later, people like Mr. Milosevic, Mr. Mladic, Mr. Karadic ended up in um, war crimes tribunals or similar sorts of places in The Hague. And that was only possible, possible because evidence was gathered and proof could be submitted. And so it is important to you know gather the evidence uh, of what's going on in Ukraine now as well. I think that's a really good point in terms of the, the grading services that occur over time because you know as we discuss the conflict or you hear about it in the in the news and other areas you know i think that people that are back home watching this or whatever the case and they just think a lot of terms uh, you know just sort of a, a military assistance and to be able to provide them with the weapons that they need to win the war there's sort of just a very shallow conversation about the type of assistance that's needed and we don't recognize unless you sort of worked in the sphere that you're absolutely right like as the conflict drags on you know, the, the IDP problem only, the internally displaced persons problem continues to grow. That's pressure not only on neighboring states and countries, but it's also internal pressures being applied. And that's all productivity lost in the economy. Those are all workers that are no longer working somewhere. That's all manufacturing industrial base. And then that's, you know, 
having a negative or detrimental impact on the education system. And there's just these really the degrading, I, I'm not I'm sure of the best ways to say it, but sort of the, the degrading social system and structure that is exacerbated by long-term conflict and without the the reinvestment and the normalization and going back to what a normal society should look like. And and that I think you're actually really correct is that that is going to be very expensive in the long run to try and to, to set that back up in the right way and you yeah. know, to return a million children back to school, to get them back on track at the right grade level, to get, you know, the economy manufacturing base stood back up, the public health care systems that go along with that, not even to, to mention the the long term impact of conflict on the population and the public health care system with long term care needs that are now affecting, you know, uh, for example, 10% of the population. And so now you have a nation that is by, say, EU standards has 30% of a population has a certain access or a uh, functional need requirement. Now it's 40%. So what is the long-term economic impact of that? And I think we just don't actually realize how complex that could be at the end of the day and how much money that will require and time and investment to to rectify so Ukraine probably needs about three or four or five billion dollars a month um, in support for its economy at the moment in order to keep paying the teachers in the classrooms, to keep paying the health workers in the clinics, to uh, keep paying the people who run the public administration and so on. And because there's been a huge impact on the economy of the country of the war, you know, President Zelensky's been saying that agricultural output will be halved this year, but lots of other industries affected as well. There is a need as part of supporting Ukraine to provide that kind of assistance. Now, the positive thing to say is before all this started, Ukraine was in per capita terms 10 times as rich as countries like Afghanistan, Somalia, where there weren't these state institutions. So Ukraine did have a lot of underlying capability. And the question is, how do we keep that going? Ukraine, by European standards, wasn't a rich country. Its neighbours were two or three times as wealthy per capita, probably. But it was much richer than these places which only where people only survived because of the work of aid agencies. So the best strategy, in my opinion, is to keep supporting these national institutions through economic support, through the government of Ukraine, rather than allowing them totally to collapse so that, you know, the only way in which people can get help is through the work of the UN or the Red Cross or NGOs. I'm a supporter of that work. I'm not speaking against it, but I am saying that allowing the country to get to the point where that's the only help available is a a very bad um, scenario, a very bad outcome. And everything has its place, right? I mean, there's a place for everything in the initial media, you know, response and the immediate needs and servicing those needs versus, you know, preparing for. And as we talked about, sort of, we know this is going to be an issue now. So what can we do now to start preparing that space so that it maybe it doesn't take 10 years, it takes seven years, you know, for example, uh, to be able to work through these things. Now, we we do have to ask a question because there'll be a lot of commentary in terms of well, just providing money is never the solution because of corruption, because of, you know, you don't know where the money is going because it doesn't actually work. And it's better to deliver things as opposed to money. I'm sure you've heard this argument in many different countries. It's not just Ukraine, and, but in every sort of international mission, it's always the sort of same discussion on transparency and effectiveness of money versus goods and things. Yeah. What is your so, What is your view on that? Well, you're right that um, there's been a lot of skepticism about whether simply providing cash money is um, the best thing to do. And because of all that skepticism, these cash transfer programs are amongst the most heavily evaluated, scrutinized, monitored, reviewed of any activity in the, the whole sphere of international development, cooperation and humanitarian assistance. And what the evidence has found over 10, 15 years now is that cash, if, if anything, is less liable to um, be subject to leakage or corruption problems than um, commodities or some other forms of assistance in kind. And when people get cash, they always basically do three things with it. They buy food, they keep their kids in school, and they, they, they typically invest in an income earning um, opportunity. So this idea that you give people cash, they'll drink it all away or do other things you don't approve of is not 
not substantiated by what is now an overwhelming array of high quality evidence. Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to, to address that issue because I know it always comes up, but the cash programs have been proven to be very effective and in some very creative ways, right? And and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was either in Africa, I think it was Africa, but the, the cellular phone payments that were going around which proved to be extremely effective because it was using existing technology and systems and structures and was very common with, with people that were living there. And you didn't need this sort of massive centralized administration and structure to be able to do it. Yeah, exactly. And I've got some examples of that again in my book. In Somalia in 2017, there were these cash transfer programs run for 300,000 families, so 2 million people, sending them by text message, effectively a voucher that they could redeem in their local market for food. And that meant that because one of the features of human organization is when there's purchasing power, there will be a response. Some private sector supplier will want to get the money that's available from that voucher. And, you know, whereas in the 2011 response in Somalia, the same place, what was happening was that extremist groups were hijacking food convoys. They couldn't do that in 2017 because you can't hijack a text message, basically. Um, So it proved much, that proved a very effective way of getting purchasing power to people. And it's just one of the examples of how we can use modern technology to deal with some of these risks that we've previously been stymied by in these big, um, these big crises. Well, Mark, thank you very much uh, for your time today. It's been a very interesting conversation and talking about these, you know, these larger sort of structures and issues and international response and and sort of what the future might hold for us. And and obviously some of the tools and ways that we can mitigate some of the risks that we see now. Uh, You did mention that some of these examples were in your book. So if somebody wanted to get a hold of your book, where can they do that? Well, it, it, you can get it from any bookstore, actually. It's called Relief Chief, a Manifesto for Saving Lives in Dire Times. It's published by the Center for Global Development, who I work for now. And if you go onto their um, website and look at it, I think you'll find a quite an attractive discount voucher on there as well. So um, that's my top recommendation on where to get it. Great. That's perfect. I do recommend that everybody reads it. It's been an interesting read for me so far. It really resonates with a lot of work that I've seen and done in the past myself. And of course, if anybody wants to reach out and connect with you, Mark, how can we best do that? So I'm on Twitter um, at Sir Mark Lowcock. I, 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 and, and then I'm at the Center for Global Development. And my contact details are there. The Center for Global Development is a think tank based in Washington, Um, DC. And we generate a lot of really high quality research and policy ideas for practitioners um, working on all these issues, humanitarian and longer term development issues. Okay, great. So everybody check out the Center for Global Development. And Mark, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you around. Thanks. Thanks so much. This podcast is brought to you in partnership between Capacity Building International and the International Emergency Management Society. You can join teams today at tiems.info. That's tiems.info. And also sign up for the International Emergency Management Newsletter by CBI at capacitybuildingint.com. Is there a topic you would like to hear about? Or are you a functional expert and want to be featured on our show? If so, reach out to us at info at capacitybuildingint.com and let us know. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.